Good morning. I get so involved in the worship, I forget everything else. And I didn't realize that was the cue. <laughs> oh my. It's so good to be here. Um, I, uh, I talked to Brother Carl a couple, multiple times, and Dina from Kenya, and said, hey, I miss you guys. Pray for me, and I know that the minute I call that you folks are 45 seconds later, you're on your face before the Lord, and I can count on you for that, and I really felt your prayers. Um, you're a blessing to me. And I told Carl my last email, I said, I don't feel at home anyplace else. And he says, well, come on home. And um, this morning I shared that at breakfast, I shared that with Steve. And uh, he said, maybe the Lord's trying to tell you something. I said, oh, if I decide to sell my house and move to North Carolina, my daughter would think I was really senile. <laughs> but you never know what the Lord's going to do. But uh, truly, um, I go to church every Sunday, and the young man that preaches is the Word is awesome. He has a passion for the Word of God. They're awesome people. But I'm, I, I'm home here. I, I don't know what that means. I don't know how to explain it. Uh, but you are so precious to me. And I know some of you by name, some of you by face. And I just complained to one of your cameramen this morning that when I watch you on TV, I don't see enough faces in the congregation. I know the focus is supposed to be the Word and Brother Phil, but uh, it's because I'm missing you that I want to see you. And I'd like to just spend hours and hours and hours with each of you to, to uh, come to know you better as brothers and sisters in Christ. You're, you have, maybe you do have an idea, but I don't know whether you do or not. There's not much, there are not many places like you in the world, nor in America. Um, and I visit a lot of places. And so I'm honored that, uh, that you welcome me as a sister in Christ. You welcome me as family. That you pray for me, that you care for me. That is so awesome. Um, where I live in Ohio, um, that's not my native. My native is Charlottesville, Virginia, which is, you've been in the news yesterday. Um, when I come back to Ohio, it's a place that Richard and I settled because our daughter lived there. And we'd come home and we would, we would be with our grandchildren to watch them, the short time we would have with them, and uh, then we'd go back to Kenya and continue ministering. And so I didn't meet people or know people there. Um, I have a couple of friends that have become close, and now one's moving to Iowa and the other's moving to Georgia. And I'm like, okay, Lord, what are you doing? <laughs> so, so to come here, it's like, um, it's, it's like the, the warm hug of Jesus. And I just, I wish there was a way I could express that to you that would really come across. It's not just something I'm saying. I am me. I'm totally transparent. And if I don't stop, I'll cry. So I better stop. <laughs> but um, my time in Kenya this time was very fruitful. Um, it was very difficult, as you know. Um, it was encouraging. There were many challenges and many victories. Um, as you know, I had typhoid, the worst case I've ever had. Uh, I, w I just kept saying, Lord, I'm afraid I will not die. <laughs> and there were times when I just thought, okay, I don't care if I die. It's really okay. It couldn't hurt any worse. And uh, it, there's no way to explain, explain typhoid except imagine the worst migraine you've ever had or the worst flu you've ever had and, and quadruple it. But the Lord is good. And uh, I made it through, and there's no typhoid in my blood. I'm okay. You can't come back here and... Um, and then have a blood test for typhoid because they put you in quarantine. So I had it before I left and I'm clear, so I'm good. So thank you for your prayers. <laughs> um, after Richard passed, my husband Richard passed away May a year ago, um, I knew that I had to go back to Kenya because that was his desire. Uh, I asked him one time, I said, if the Lord took you home, what would you want me to do? And he said, wait a reasonable time and go back to Kenya. So I knew that was my object objective. 
And so, uh, in obedience, in the right time, I stepped out in, in April and went to Kenya. And praise the Lord, he sent a longtime friend with me, a young lady that uh, we had lost contact for 25 years. And in December, God brought us back together and in a very important time in her life. In February, her mom passed away and, um, and then her dad had a, a, a bad hemorrhage. And, uh, and it was a difficult time in my life and she had never been on the mission field. She'd been out of the country, but never on the mission field. And she's just a good old country girl from Greene County, Virginia. And I said, Lou, how about coming to Kenya with me? And she did, and ended up staying three weeks, a week longer than she had planned, and it was a huge blessing. The Lord really moved. Well, the Sunday that we were both supposed to be down country where we normally would speak, uh, I had spoken in the home church the first Sunday, and then the next Sunday we were supposed to be back at another church in that area, and both of us had food poisoning. And I thought, well, I guess I'm not supposed to go back there because that was another bout that wasn't any fun. And during that time home on Sunday, we both were just quiet. And Lou was in the living room, the little place I was staying, worshiping quietly. And all of a sudden, I heard this moaning. This, oh, I thought, what's going on? Is she okay? And she was on her. F Sorry. She was on her face before the Lord. And when she came from that situation. An hour and a half later, she said, Jane, the Lord gave me something for you. And I said, okay, what? Because I'm, I'm there in obedience to the Lord, not knowing what's going on, not knowing the next step, and, and saying, okay, Lord, I'm here by faith. I have no clue what you're doing. I'm just going by rote. And she brought me to Isaiah 43, 19. Behold, I'm going to do a new thing. I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And I thought, wow. And from there, God began to unfold the new things that he wanted in my life. Richard and I served the Lord together for 30 years, pretty much in one location with one group, and did what the Lord told us to do. And all of a sudden, God began to make it very clear that the word of prophecy that my spiritual daughter had given me the day that Richard passed away was about to come to pass. The day Richard passed away, he was, praise God, his mind was good. He was lying in the bed giving James instructions how to fix something so the next team could come to the team house. And Mary came in the door and she said, Mom, she said, the Lord has given me a word for you and I want you to hear me. She said, I've been an interpreter for the largest women's conference in Kenya for many years. So two or three thousand women come every year and speakers come from all over the world to speak at that conference. And she said, not a one of those women has touched on a personal level the hearts of women the way you have. And God wants to broaden your ministry. And I'm like, oh sure, okay. And I probably told you that when I was here before and I'm like, oh sure. Well, that's exactly what it appears as if the Lord is doing. Very definitely a new thing. I'm going to share tonight with your elders the details. I'll just give you the surface. God has opened um, locations for me in central Kenya through a pastor that was an overseer in our former area. He has gone to multiple churches there to open other churches. I have a full schedule if, when I am able to go back. Um, places have opened in western Kenya through David Anyango, whose name I have trouble pronouncing. Um, you know that name. And please forgive me, he sent you a lovely plaque for the church and I left it in the trunk of my car. So you'll get it next Sunday. <laughs> but uh, at any rate, he, spring, he sends his greetings. But, and then the Lord opened places through him for, uh, in Nairobi and through another pastor friend that has helped me get my work permit again um, in a large church in the slums of Nairobi. And the Lord just keeps opening doors, which I had no idea of. Open new ministries, new venues, um, teaching leaders. I'd never done a leaders conference, and I'm like, what do I do now? And um, the Lord led me to the seven churches of Revelation and how the churches in America and Kenya correlate to everything that's happened in the seven churches of Revelation. And then um, the Lord led me an exciting new ministry, Young Men, which was very far out of my Baptist training. 
But the way the Lord opened it, the young men who've never understood God's plan and purpose for marriage, they live the cultural marriage and don't know how to love their wives as Christ loved the church. And with the large majority of women in Kenya being abused from birth, it forms many problems. And so divorce is one of the biggest problems in Kenya today. And when God opened that door to me to minister in two different locations, five different times, to groups of young men, I was overwhelmed. And I, I hesitate to tell you the, the fun part of it, but I'm going to. It's not pride, but it's, it was excitement. And maybe you won't understand it, but... Having never done that before, the first time I sat down with my interpreter, my interpreter's husband, Pastor Paul, and I said, okay, what do I do? I don't know what to talk to these guys about. It's just kind of off the cuff here. So I shared Richard's and my love story. And when I finished, a young man stood up and he said, I'm 29 years old. And he said, I'm married and I have two children. He said, I have never heard anything like that. And they began to ask a few questions because they didn't even know the questions to ask me. And when they were finished, these 25 young men stood up to thank me for coming. And they gave me the presidential applause, which I don't know if you guys have ever gotten that in Kenya, but it's overwhelming. It's like... And they did that 10 times. And I was so weak, I couldn't get out of the chair. <laughs> because I knew that that was an open door that God had opened for me, a very likely unlikely person to do that. And I thought, oh my goodness. So God began to open new venues. And this morning, I, I kept saying, Lord, what do you want me? Uh, I, I, Carl said, in Kenya they say give greetings. Well, sometimes that's five minutes and sometimes that's 40 minutes. And you don't know what that looks like. And so I said, let's clarify this. What am I supposed to do? And then Carl said, and Brother Phil said this morning, whatever the Lord lays on your heart. I said, Lord, what do you want me to say? And as we sang this morning, everything in the singing confirmed exactly what the Lord had given me. It's going to be a little different. Um, and maybe not, because you guys are totally transparent. That's one thing I appreciate you, Brother Phil. Um, you always share who you are. You always share um, that the ground at the foot of the cross is level. And in Kenya, I'm sure our brothers are very aware of this, Generally speaking, the leadership does ne never lets you know they have problems. They are in charge. They are above everyone else. Uh, they are served rather than serving. Um, many, not all, many. In fact, over the 30 years, most. And they have the chief mentality that says the chief of the family, the chief of the church, the chief of the tribe, the chief of the country can do no wrong. And so I've never heard a Kenyan pastor share transparently his problems or the fact that he's real or the fact that I too am, am, am uh, often victim to these weaknesses of the flesh. And so the, I guess that's kind of how the Lord has really opened doors for me because, you know, Flip Wilson used to say, what you see is what you get. And that's pretty much who I am. And one letter written uh, by Pastor Paul at the end of the conferences, he said he had been to many conferences for men and multiple conferences of other varieties, but he had never seen a minister of the gospel be so transparent and share the way I had shared. And these young men were lost in the jungle of marriage, and they were so grateful. And it was the same with the ladies, and this, but I'm just me. You know, I, I stand up and sometimes don't have a clue what the Lord wants me to say, and, and then the Lord speaks, and that's exciting when you know that, that's, that the Lord did what he wanted done. And so as I began to, to think about what the Lord would have me to share this morning, I knew it wasn't the details of everything. I can give that to you guys later. But um, I wanted to share a little bit of my husband's testimony with you. I'm sorry that you never had an opportunity to meet him. Um, you would have loved him. He's your kind of people. He, uh, he would have fit right in here. He'd have been, he'd, he, had not, he had two left feet. He couldn't dance. He couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. But he would swing and he would sway and he would sing how great thou art in four, three languages. And, 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 
and he sang Amazing Grace, and, and I almost lost it this morning when you sang that, brother. I've, you almost had to pick me up out of the pew. But he, he, would, have, he would have loved meeting you and being here. Um, he was a strong man, a dedicated man, a determined, loving man, gentle, and full of pure grace. Anybody that would live with me for 58 years had to be full of God's grace. I appreciated what you had to say this morning about the brother and sister been married 60 years. We didn't quite make it. We only had 58, but um, it was his, my husband's grace. And his unconditional for the love for the Lord and his unconditional love for me that brought us through in every avenue. Um, we worked in the church for 22 years. Rick was part of everything. Missions committee, board of elders, chairman of the board of deacons, preached, taught, did youth groups, the whole wad. We were saved in 1964, and we set out to save to serve. And we served and served and served and served and served and served. But I don't think we ever really grew. Um, you know, um, <laughs> some people get saved, and you grow a little bit in your journey, and then you kind of do things your own way, and you, you kind of forget that God is in charge. And he has a plan, and he wants to do it his way in your life. Um, my husband was an architect, engineer, builder, and he built buildings, he built everything, and built walls against God many times, and walls against the pain in this world. Every time we'd have a missions conference, it'd be three or four days with missionaries from all over the world, and I'm poking him, and he's, sure, we'll just put up another light on the mission board, and help this missionary get a car, or help this missionary do that, or help this missionary, they need money, let me do this or that. And then he'd go on. He'd go on his, his own way. He supported every opportunity to help missionaries in every way. Uh, he was an example to that. We got to know them. We kept them in our home. There was one missionary with New Tribes Mission, Brother Mel Wyma. He stayed with us, and oh, I was like, oh my goodness. He reached the unreached tribes in South America, and, oh, and every time he'd come, we'd stand in the driveway and say, this must be how the, how the disciples left, felt when Jesus left. And I thought, oh my goodness, you know, they can do all these things, but not me, buddy. And that's how he felt. <laughs> but he never allowed God to truly, to truly touch his heart to the depth that God wanted to. Not that he didn't love the Lord, not that he didn't serve the Lord, he had given his heart to the Lord. He knew all of that. He, he was in a shining example in every way in the church, in every, you name it. He was a servant in every respect. And then one day in 1985, our daughter, our last born daughter, had been behind the Iron Curtain with Campus Crusade uh, teaching and doing gymnastics and, and had some incredible experiences that... Um, yeah, we're pretty scary for a parent. You know, you couldn't talk to them. You didn't mention where they were because it would damage the ministry. And she came home from college one day, and my, we had built the ultimate dream house in, on 33 acres in Virginia, 5,400 square feet, five and a half bathrooms, four fireplaces, you know, gorgeous house, a full basement, two apartments for missionaries to come for R&R. &R. Took my husband eight years of toil and strain with no money to build it. And we had built, he had built that particularly for missionary R&R. &R. We were in the house. We'd moved in. We only lived in a year and a half before God called us the mission field. But before the Lord called us, my daughter came home from university one day, and she said, Dad, just out of the clear blue sky, she said, Dad, what are they going to write on your tombstone? And she left the room. And my husband sort of stood there, and he said, Well, I built all these buildings. I served you in the church. I did this. I did that. You know, Lord, I gave. I gave my money. I gave my time. And I'm going to have missionaries here. And Richard's story was he heard the Lord say, Richard, that's nice. But I'm going to burn it all up because it has no kingdom purpose. Whoa. <laughs> So my husband came out of there and we went to church the next Sunday and a young man from Campus Crusade just happened to sit by us in church and he came to talk to my daughter because Danielle was then going to go to Kenya and to Bulgaria to do gymnastics shows and, and lead people to Christ through the salvation message. 
And he starts sharing all these wonderful things that he had learned in a year stint uh, program in Uganda, including some of the, uh, shall we say, outdoor facility experiences, which if you haven't been there, you don't get it. Um, and right in the middle of the conversation, he turned to my husband and says, you too can experience this. And my husband said, not me, buddy. I got my own plan. <laughs> That was Easter Sunday on Mother's Day, 1985. My husband went forward in church, dragging me down the aisle and said, Lord, I think I want to be a missionary. He said, I want to help you. <laughs> and God, I'm sure God chuckled because he really didn't need Richard's help. <laughs> And because Richard had always done it. He was raised in, during the Depression where a man did what he did and he did it to, he, he was trained, I'm going to do it and I have to provide and I have to do all of this. And that was his underlying mentality. And Rick was a strong, determined man that God knew he could trust. Two weeks after we committed our lives to the Lord, my husband fell off a scaffold in Northern Virginia and ruptured two discs, almost went bankrupt. My dad and his dad came to rescue the job and finish it. The next 18 months, my husband had cardiac angioplasty four times and a stroke during catheterization. And our Christian friends said, I guess now you know God doesn't want to use you. And my husband said, quite the contrary. God had some work to do before he could trust me out there. And that was when my husband began to present his body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable in the Lord, which was his reasonable service. And God truly began to transform him, to make him fit to serve. It was a journey of 30 years. Mind you, we had never done anything like this. I quit camp in Front Royal, Virginia, because I didn't like the outhouses and the snakes and the bats. And God sent me to, out of this big house to the rural bush village to live in two rooms, ten feet square, cobras under the counter, bats in the ceiling, witch doctors everywhere. One lady in the church when I went back in Virginia and told the story, she said, Jane, was divorce ever considered? I said, no, just murder. <laughs> and yet one day I'm, I'm, um, I'm kind of known as Miss Sparkles or Miss Fru Fru. Um, and one day, a lady in our church had made me these little jumpers, you know, that, out of the dollar a yard material from, I'm sorry, I'm used to being active. Uh, and they, they kind of hang, and then they come down and blow your ankles. And I had three T-shirts to go with each one with the colors and, and knee socks to match each one to keep the bugs away and those little kids to match everything. And one day, I'm sitting in a bush village on a log, 35 mamas around me, and heaven only knows how many runny-nosed children. I thought... I think I like this. This must be God. This must be what God wants for me. Because my idea of camping out was the Hilton Hotel. I'm sorry, I quit camping because I didn't like that stuff, but God, you've got a unique sense of humor. And so I lived in that bush village for six years. And I thought, wow, it's amazing. When we went to that bush village, and God began to move. Neither of us had ever formed a ministry. There were no other missionaries there, no other white people in the village except the Catholic nuns you never saw. And when your car broke down the mud puddle, they just drive right by. You never saw them. And surrounded by the witch doctors, and I was a good Baptist for many years, I didn't know that there was such a thing as spiritual warfare. In that era, they didn't teach that. They do now, praise the Lord. They learned it really is important. I learned on the job warfare. I learned to come against the enemy. Um, witch doctor in your backyard, surrounded by them, chicken feet floating on the water barrel when you wake up, eggs sitting straight on a tilted surface and not rolling. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I learned, um, and the rest of it is history, a long history. God blessed us with with opportunities to teach, to preach. I hadn't taught 
in 17 years or maybe 10 years when I went to Kenya and the first time I did a ladies conference I told them everything I knew the first day and I thought what do I do now and young a, a dear friend Jack Grissom good old time Methodist pastor he said Jane he said just give it all the Lord he'll do it and I went out there next day my knees knocking under my skirt I thought I don't have anything Lord he said just hang in there now keep in mind I was a lady who with Child Evangelism Fellowship could not make my mouth and the flannel graph work together. I'm serious. It just didn't happen. And I saw God put my hand on the board and draw pictures to explain what he wanted to tell those ladies. And I'm like, whoa. And I knew, okay, Lord, I, I got your message loud and clear. And this period of time without Richard for the past 15 months has been finding out who Jane is and what God wants Jane to do. That's what God began to show me in Kenya. Uh, as you were talking this morning about trials and testings and discouragements and, and battles, and, and you kind of go to the mission field thinking, oh, this is wonderful. I'm a missionary. I'm serving the Lord. It's going to be great. And then you hit the ground and it all hits the fan. <laughs> and you're like, oh dear. You wonder why you're surprised when James says, don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trials you go through because they are for what? Perfecting your faith. Perfecting your... To conform us to the image of Christ. Um, the... The testings we went through in Kenya were unbelievable. Second day in country, broke his arm. Um, left hand sh stick shift, didn't work. I don't drive in that crazy country. Um, just little things at first. And then 11 years ago, we were hit by a bus. I understand the brother that was hit. My husband was paralyzed from the neck down, out of body at the scene, subsequently had eight spinal surgeries. but never stopped thanking God, never stopped presenting his body as a living sacrifice every minute of every day. Literally the day he died, he was laying in the bed giving our James instructions how to fix something for the next team to come. And we put him in the car and he passed away. He was totally committed. Paul said, I've fought a good fight, a worthy, honorable, noble, noble fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. I've firmly held on to the faith. As I walk through the cemetery, I've tried not to go visit every day. It's a little hard sometimes because it's close by. But as I walk through and I read the stones, I wonder... What was this or that person like? Did they know the Lord? Are they in eternity with Jesus? Did they struggle? Did they suffer? Were they committed to the Lord? Were they just Christians in the church? Was their life fruitful for the kingdom purpose? Did they receive the well done? In Kenya, as you well know, they had the best runners in the world. These guys, oh my goodness, you see them out on the road morning, noon, and night over tough land running and, and, and preparing for the race. They have to prepare their minds and their bodies and they never stop. Rain, they keep going. They don't just show up at the starting line and run the race and expect to win. It's a long process of consistency to train and discipline the mind and the body. Apostle Paul said in Corinthians, he said, do you not, not know that you're in a race, all run, that in a race all runners compete, but only one receives the prize. So run your race that you may lay hold of the prize and make it your own. As believers, God has a special race for each one of us. Mine's different from yours. Yours is different from mine in location, in style, 
but he has a plan for each one of us. Paul said that the ancient Olympics were an example of what the Christian life should be like. And he gave many examples in his letters about running the race and, and giving everything that you have. And he said, do it with all your might. Whatever you do, do with all your might. Give it everything you've got. If, the, if a runner shows up at the starting line and has had a casual training and no commitment, he will never win the race. But there's a divine purpose for you and for me. Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans that I have for you, he says. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. But so many of us don't listen. So many of us don't hear. My husband was saved for 20 years before he really received that into his heart. He was 54 years of age when we went to the mission field. Turned down by mission boards because of his health. Two big mission boards turned us down, said your health does, is not compatible with the job. And God opened the door for us to go, and he had 30 years of service. God has a plan, but the enemy also has a plan. And that plan is to steal, to kill, and to destroy, to just snatch away that seed, not your salvation, but the kingdom purpose that God has for you. And in Kenya, I, I don't ever assume that they've ever seen a lion devouring their prey. Many times only Westerners have seen those, but I graphically describe it. What does it look like when the, a lion devours his prey? You can hear him crunching the bones, tearing the flesh. It's a vivid example of what Paul was trying to convey to us. It's not a game. It is not a game. And the enemy will do whatever he can. We know that the victory is ours, praise God. But he, the enemy is going to do everything he can to keep us from fulfilling the plan that God ha has for us. Do you want to fulfill God's plan and purpose in your life? If you do, you can't be casual or half-hearted about your Christian life. I love what Brother Ken shared with me, I think the last time I was here. I believe you said you'd been here for 10 years, there. When he first came, what he saw was the fruit of the Spirit in action, in abundance. And that's why I stayed. Am I correct in what you said to me? And he's right. But I never assume, I never, wherever I am, that everybody is on that page. I never assume that each one is fulfilling the purpose for their life that God called them to. God wants to turn your world upside down. Paul said in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, he says, Therefore, because we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us and run with patience the race that's set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy, the joy of the cross, joy that was set before him, went to the cross, and is now seated at the right hand of God the Father. If you're serious about wanting to fulfill God's plan in your life, no time like the present. Many Christians are in a spiritual rut. Definitions of rut is a grave open on both ends. They're bored of doing the same old thing. Somehow believe that, God, uh, believe that God has a plan, has a will, but aren't sure what that looks like. They struggle to make decisions. They're unfamiliar with any criteria other than their own self-interest. They grope for a meaning, meaning in the daily humdrum. Having no larger context or vision than their own daily experience. Tunnel vision. Many have little or no vision for God's plan and purpose for them. They want to serve a cause, 
but have no agenda. Only dozens of disconnected opportunities. When we first went to the mission field, there was no such thing as a mission team coming, and now they're going everywhere to do everything. And one week they think they've got it, and they know exactly what this is like. And then they go on about their business and about their life. One team we had that came many years ago, they were the cream of the crop of 350 teenagers. We had 23 teenagers and 10 adults with that team. And praise God, out of that group of teenagers today, there are 10 of them in full-time mission service, ministry of some variety. But that's rare because I've been on a mission trip. I've done my job. I've done my duty. They've served a cause, but not connected to anything. They read the Bible, they pray, they go to church, they do everything right. But have never really truly experienced the fullness of the adventurous, abundant life, walking every day in the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul said, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for you know that your labor is not in vain. Everybody can't go to Africa. Everybody can't do like Brother, Brother Ken does with the children. But you can fulfill the purpose that God has for you right where you are. People are hurting out there. I was sharing last night, I think. I've lost track of the days. <laughs> I was in... Since I came home from Kenya this time, it's been harder. I miss Richard so much. Grief Share Group said the second year is often the most difficult. And I spend about 90% of my time alone. And I thought, I, I just can't do this. And yet, Lord, I want to be available to you. Whatever you want. And a nice man stopped me in the parking lot of Home Depot just to admire my dog. I have a big 103-pound Ridgeback. And an hour and 45 minutes later, while his little pickup was running, he had shared his whole life story with me, his family, how his, his wife, his, her mom had walked out on when she was eight years old, and he had been committed to his wife. You could see his love for his wife. It just oozed like a teenager. This man was in his mid-60s. But you could see how much he loved the Lord and how much he loved his wife. And his daughter, her husband, the daughter's husband just walked out on her for another man and this man was Lenny was his name having trouble having trouble forgiving the young man and yet wanting to and wanting to trust and I mean I don't know how we got to that but he was hurting so he felt free because I said Lord I'm, I'm in pain I, I'll, I'll tell you I'm hurting but he said Jane in your pain you can still minister and I thought, okay. And numbers of those opportunities have come just by me showing up somewhere. And I'm like, Lord, I really don't want to do this today because I'm too bad. Somebody come and pat me on the back and somebody come and hold me when Richard's not there to keep me warm. And then I said, okay, I'll walk the dog. Or I'll go to the store. Or I'll go to Goodwill. I have to be careful with that. But it's amazing what happens when we just say, Lord, I'm available or whatever you want. And Richard was that way. Richard was the, the watchman on the wall, the soldier keeping guard. He was committed. He endeavored through, he, he pursued, uh, he endeavored through many, many problems. Physical problems, mission problems. One young man committed to the Lord years ago, came to the States, basically stole everything, went back to Kenya, stole everything, and then with a three-foot piece of pipe tried to kill my husband. My husband calmly persevered, calmly persevered, never, never missed a beat. Me, I'm off the wall emotional. <laughs> he was just calm. He was steady because his heart was so committed to the Lord. He endured physical pain. After the accident being hit by a bus, he was in level 8 to 10 pain for 10 years. And the only one that knew was me and his doctor. Nothing stopped the pain. He never, never said, why God? 
He was a blessing like this young man you were talking about this morning. He praised God through the whole thing. He continued. After the accident, we, he came home and in four months he had, had four major spinal surgeries, cervical spine surgeries. In between each surgery, he'd go back and work on the project. Never complaining. He was in the hospital one time, 15 days, for a spider bite from Kenya, almost killed him. Got out of the bed, went back to Kenya. God healed it in Kenya, by the way. Mayo Clinic didn't even know what to do. <laughs> he persevered. He presented his body as a living sacrifice every day. He was faithful to the end. There was one attack after another. The enemy attacked in every avenue you can imagine. Um, like I said, I didn't know much about living in a bush village. My first experience with a witch doctor was quite scary, but I learned on the job warfare. Why do I tell you all of these things? One, so you can know me better. And I appreciate you praying for me. But the main reason is, when my husband finally came to the point in his life, when he did what the Apostle Paul said, I present my body as a living sacrifice to you every day, every minute of every day for what you want for me to do. That's when the joy of serving Jesus began. And that's when the fruit began to really flow because then it was done in, by the power of the Holy Spirit, not in the flesh. I don't know how much wood, hay, and stubble, but I know there's a ton of fruit. And I know that he is sitting there in heaven, having received the well done, and that crown of righteousness is his. I know that. The battle was fierce. The battle is still fierce. As you know, I had battles on every side in Kenya this time. But the joy that came in the times of God's direction, and one particular conference was in a church situation I'm used to. I won't go into all the details, but um, I had found out that the overseer of the church of eight churches, a man I'd known for many years, He's standing in the pulpit and he's preaching and he's committing adultery with a lady in the congregation. Just happened to be in my ladies' meeting and everybody knew it. The whole district knew it. And nobody had ever confronted him. And the new pastor is actually, it's, a, it's the wife of the former pastor that they called back because she was the spiritual mother of so many. The church went down to 17 people from a couple hundred people. And while I was doing a leadership conference, Basically, next door, within a 10-mile radius, this man was doing a leadership conference for the pastors in the whole area that knew everything was going on. Talk about a little leaven leavening the whole lump. And you talk about the last days. I have this against you. You're tolerating sin. Jezebel's among you. And, I, and, I, and there was controversy because the man in charge of what I thought he was in charge of what I was doing God had taken that position away from him, and now my interpreter and other friends were in charge. And I just said, no, I'm not going. I'm not going to step in the middle of your conflict. It defeats the purpose God's called me, and I just said, no. And in the night, the Lord woke me and said, Jane, you go. He said, I'll bless you when you go. You stand up and do what I tell you to do. And I, I went in obedience. And obedience is the key, whether we want to do it or not. And I didn't want to go, because I'm not good at conflict. In mission school, on those crazy psychological tests, my husband was a 9.9, .9, how to handle conflict. I was a minus 1.8. <laughs> and the last thing I wanted to do was step in the middle of that conflict. And yet, I showed up. And the boldness. It was almost, I'm, it, it seemed like an out-of-body experience because I was watching God do it. And I thought, okay, all I got to do is be a fat lady, faithful, available, and teachable. I just show up. And that's what God said, dude, just show up, Jane. Just show up. I'm learning to walk by myself. 
I walked with my husband for 58 years. I walked in ministry with him for 30 years. But God indeed is doing a new thing. And I said to a pastor after Rick passed away, someone who knew my husband really well, I said, Lindsay, I said, God, I got big shoes to fill. He said, no, you don't. He said, you've walked in those shoes with him for 30 years. He said, now God's going to fill your shoes and you'll walk with the Lord. We look at all the scriptures, stories in the Old Testament of the saints, and how they how they persevered through many problems. You look at Joseph and Joseph's story, thrown in a pit, falsely accused, came out second in charge in Egypt. God has a good plan. It doesn't feel good. It rarely feels good when we're going through it. It's kind of like you're being pulled through a keyhole backwards, but you're like, okay, Lord. And there were times, even in the past month since I've been home, in my loneliness, I said, like the prophet under the juniper tree, oh, Lord, what the heck am I doing here? Why am I doing this? Woe is me for the day I was born. Why don't you just take me home? Let me die right now and go to be with Jesus. After all, I'm 78 years old. I, I've served you for 30 years. I've done my part. And the Lord just chuckled. <laughs> you can just hear him like, <laughs> I hear you, Jane. It's okay. It's all right. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abound in the work of the Lord. For you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. What did we write on Richard's tombstone? I fought the good, noble, honorable fight. I finished the race and I've kept the faith. I've held firmly to the faith because that is indeed what he did. We're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. And there are different opinions as to whether those are people that we've known included in the ranks of the saints. I prefer to, I believe it's those people who've endured the things and, and have, have stood steadfast and have served the Lord with commitment. Never looking back, never wavering, forgetting those things which are behind and pressing toward the mark for the prize, the high calling in Christ Jesus. And I believe indeed my husband is one of those. And every now and then I can hear him say, Honey, <laughs> when I want to quit and want to give up, that's only my soul. That's my emotions. Grief is still very young in my life. And as the head of the mission group at the church, my daughter's church, when he took me to the airport, he put his arm around me, and I was like, Oh, God, I don't want to do this. I'm going to face all that by myself, not knowing half of what I would face. And he looked at me and he said, Jane, remember one thing. You are very far ahead of most people in grief. He said, but your grief is still very raw. And there are days it's very raw. I'll tell you what, I cry a lot. Man, I knew from the time I was 18 years of age, that's all I ever knew. And yet, God's doing a new thing. I'm pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. And as God is my witness... That last song, the, the potter, Lord, mold me, make me, transform me into what you want me to be, that I might be useful for the kingdom purpose until I'm so old that I can't, and you take me home. And that's my heart, and I'm so glad that God wants my heart. A young man, a good friend of ours, who um, the Lord just happened to send from Rwanda while I was there to help get some things straightened out. I'll share all that with you guys tonight. Um, Naphtali came in and he had been a part of our life for many years and had had, had an opportunity to be the, the greatest clinical psychologist in all of Kenya. Knew everybody, knows everybody. And God directed him to go to Rwanda, give up everything and go to Rwanda and work with the, with the wounded families from the genocide. And he, he, he came by and was talking with me and helping with some things. And he looked at me and he said, Jane, what do you want? And I thought, okay, that's a trick question. 
don't know. I said, what do I want, Naphtali? First of all, I want to know the heart of God. Do you know the heart of God for you? Do you know what he wants for you? And I said, second of all, I want to know God's plan and purpose for me. And I want to step out by faith into his will for me, whatever it looks like, whether I'm 78 or 178. That's my spirit. That's my heart. And God just forgives me for my emotions because he knows it's okay. Where is your heart? Do you have the heart of God? Are you living in the Christian rut? If, if all of the people in the world or just America that say they're Christians were committed, then Islam would not be the fastest growing religion in the world. If all of the 85% Kenyans that say they're Christians, you wouldn't have the problems you've had in Kenya. And I won't go into details concerning those. You probably wouldn't believe me anyway, but somehow we have covered it all over and we have churchianity and religiosity the time is short you stand the majority of you that I know all that I know and the majority of the rest of you stand firm on the Word of God you practice what you preach you realize that love is a verb not a noun you put action to the Word of God. You live it out every day. And I pray that as you live it out and as you do what you know the right thing is, that you also daily, hourly, present your body as a living sacrifice, wholly, completely, totally, absolutely acceptable unto God, because that's the very least you can do for someone who was nailed to a cross and bled for you and took all of your sin and my sin on him at that cross. There's never been a question for me of God's love for me in recent days. And I pray that you understand his love also. And mostly that you understand his amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Young people particularly. Not that us old guys can't be used, okay? The world is nasty if you haven't figured it out already. The enemy is out there to snatch everything that you've had the blessing of knowing in this place. To snatch it away from you. Commit yourself now. Make the decisions to show up at the starting line, disciplined in body, mind, and spirit, trained in every area that God wants to use you, and ready for the race so that you can receive the prize. Not ones that are not so young, a little older. It's not over. It's just beginning. Today's a new day. See that lady at the checkout line. See that man that you may know in your neighborhood that whose wife ran off from him and left him. Christians, teacher in a Christian school, ran off and left her wonderful husband and family to go to the Miami Gaming Center, gambling center. Found a boyfriend and a broken husband at home crying his eyes out. See that man, a Christian man I know very well, married for many, many years. About eight years ago, his wife told him, I never loved you. Three years ago, she divorced him. He's in ministry. He's in music ministry. He's wonderful. Stood firm. He's been a help to me. He's standing firm in the face of all the pain and agony. It's not always physical pain, okay? Brother Ken's been through his share of physical pain. He understands that many have. But there's all kinds of pain. But be you steadfast, unmovable, 
always, always, every minute of every day, abounding in the work of the Lord that he has called you to for the kingdom purpose, for his glory, not ours. It's not for us. It's not to pat us on the back. So many out there want the glory. The bigger church, the mega, the money, the, the notoriety, the fame. It's here, it's in the Kenya. The Lord's going to burn it all up. What are they going to write on your tombstone? Lord bless you. I love you. Thank you so much for what you mean to me. I don't know if I'll, what, when I'll see you again. Uh, I wish I didn't have to go. I wish I could be right here because you love me so much and I'm so blessed. God bless you. Be steadfast.